Uh, hello and welcome to the spinal cord injury forum tonight. Um, my name is Jeannie Hoffman and I'm a rehabilitation psychologist here at the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and I am a co-director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury Model System at the University of Washington. Um, the forums, the video recordings, all of our online media content are made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Tonight, we are very pleased to welcome a wonderful panel of individuals who are going to talk about their experiences about finding or getting back to work. Um, we're very grateful to have them come in tonight. We also have the pleasure of having a colleague of mine that I work with regularly on the inpatient rehab unit, Kurt Johnson, who's a rehabilitation counselor who helps people with that whole process of return to work. Um, after um, we're going to have a conversation with our panelists and then we'll open it up to, to questions and invite you to ask questions at the end. So thank you all for coming. So I do want to um, first kind of talk a little bit about um, kind of the panelists in general and then I'll have them all introduce themselves. Um, we have um, kind of a variety of people here. We have somebody who was injured while they were in high school, somebody who was injured in college, um, and somebody who was injured when they were working and was able to return um, to their employer. And so pretty different stories, um, but I think the you know, thing that is um, really truth, very true for all of them, having had a chance to talk to them before, is that um, they all were very motivated to get into the workforce and, um, and have done a fantastic job of moving that way. So I'm gonna turn to them and ask them a bunch of questions. So Elaine, let's just start with you because Elaine was injured in high school. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of when you were injured and uh, um, how old you were? Yes, I was 17 and uh, got in a car accident um, while I was in the Army. And I had a C7 level spinal cord injury. Was at Good Samaritan Hospital in Charlotte for about six months. And um, I was working at a bookstore part-time because I was still in high school. And um, was able, I had a tutor in the hospital, was able to graduate on time and finish high school uh, with my class. And um, I've always been a really motivated person to work or to go to school. What part of the year were you injured during high school? The end of my junior year of high okay. school. So you junior. were tutored through school and then you went back to class? Yes, I okay. sure did. And yeah. you said you were working um, while you were a junior in high school when yes. you were injured. Did yes. you end up going right back to that job or did you uh, just was, go back to school? I went back to school. It was a bookstore and they were very nice to me. The, the family, it was a family owned bookstore. And, uh, but it would have been really difficult. Um, it was like a paperback exchange that involved a lot of lifting and shelving and it would have been difficult for me. But I went back to school and um, when I graduated, I went to a vocational program to be a a travel uh, consultant, and they don't even have a travel consultants anymore. But you didn't know that in 1984, you know? so it was before the internet was really big and Expedia and right. thing. So at the time, it seemed like a great career choice. Absolutely, I was going to change the travel industry for people with disabilities. <laughs> so, but then it was minimum wage with no benefits. So that's why it's good to do some, you know, career exploration before you take a training program. But I've never regretted taking that. It was six months and you had to dress in business attire and every day, it was Monday through Friday, I made lifelong friends and I was actually able to use some of the credit toward my bachelor's degree. So it was, I never consider any school a waste of time. Absolutely. So um, Elaine, when you were in high school and finishing up high school, did you get any help from the career counselor at school or from anyone to kind of help guide you in making that choice or did you kind of just seek that out on your own? I really sought it out on my own. My brother's two years older and he went to the same vocational school in their auto mechanics program and I just didn't think I was a college person. I thought it was some sort of IQ number that I didn't have and high school was a place to meet my friends and I just I thought, I don't know, I had this idea in my head of what a college person was and that I was not. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I'm the first college graduate in my family and we just, I just wasn't college minded. So that vocational program was my first baby step into going back to school. And also my tutor in the hospital, you know, she told me, she gave me my first A and told me I'm still Elaine and took me to my first Shakespearean play and we're still friends uh -huh. now, 30 years later. 
so I just told my age again. I did that with you too. I'm 47, okay? Yeah, so <laughs> just get it yeah, out there. Just get it out there, yeah. Not gonna say how much I weigh though. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, she really changed my life and I actually ended up be becoming a teacher and I'm, I'm sure that's largely, you know, because of her, because she really changed my life. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, if anything, I, I got that from her, but not so much from high school. So I really didn't know what I was going to do um, after I graduated, but I think a lot of, you know, anyone goes through that right. you know, with, with being unsure. Yeah, I'm curious, Kurt, um, working with people with new injuries who are, um, I know you don't work with the young population, um, but what kind of resources are you aware of that's through the school district? Well, working with rehab medicine on the eighth floor there, I, I, we do work with adolescents, 18 and older, um, folks younger than not years ago were children, but uh, one of the things that rehab counseling does is work directly with the school and uh, work with the transition specialist there to assist this student in uh, identifying what classes that they want to need to get back to, what classes they need to finish. Uh, I also do the assistive technology piece there where we uh, provide individuals with computers and internet access and any type of adaptive equipment that they might need to actually get their homework done. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll use Skype or FaceTime, those type of devices to actually uh, have face-to-face -face kinds of conferences with the, the school, the faculty, uh, the guidance counselor, that type of thing. So. We'll work with the student and the transition specialist if they're in school, if they've graduated or, or recently are going to graduate, we'll uh, bring in the Washington State Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, DVR, to um, identify what the, the employment goal is and if that employment goal is going to require them to uh, go to school. Uh, why we'll start thinking about where's the most appropriate school for them to go to, what kind of uh, classes if they are, if they've got another year of high school if they need to finish, or, or maybe they're, uh, because of their uh, recovery level, they're not going to go back to high school right away, so they're going to go to a community college to uh, some running start program or something like that that will uh, kind of help them uh, work with disabled student services at the community college to uh, get their high school degree or their GED and uh, move on to the, the college degree. Yeah, it's interesting because Elaine, when we talked, I know that you really didn't get a lot of um, extra help along that and didn't actually, at the time, happen to talk to somebody who said you didn't qualify for DVR. Right. But Eric, you had a little bit more contact with DVR, is that right? Tell us a little bit about your story, about when you were injured and kind of where you were in your life. Mm in relation to DVR as yeah. well? Yeah, I mean, you can sure. start with the, your story and then we can talk about DVR. Okay, um, so I was attending college at the University of Montana and I was an art student there uh, in the end of my junior year, I guess it was the beginning of senior year, and uh, I had a snowboarding accident, broke my neck at uh, C5, C6, and um, then I came back to uh, Edmonds, Washington to live with my parents and do rehab through the UW for about three months. And so, you did you even think about going back to school in Montana? Um, I thought about it a little bit. I didn't really want to go back there. I was kind of already tired of Montana at that point. It had been about four years of going to school there, and um, a lot of my credits wouldn't transfer to the UW or some local schools, um, and I didn't really want to have to redo a bunch of old classes, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I sort of, at the time, ruled out uh, finishing my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. So did you get right into DVR right after your injury? Get connected with Division of Vocational Rehabilitation? Actually, it took maybe three or four years, I think. Um, I got a computer from my grandparents and started messing around with some uh, editing tools like Photoshop and that kind of stuff and got into making websites. and kind of, um, I can't remember where I'd heard about them. It might have been through the UW and then just took me forever to follow through on actually doing something with it. But um, at that point, I kind of knew what I wanted to do, which was freelance web design. And uh, so I went in there with a plan and then they helped me uh, buy some software and hardware to uh, launch my own you know, career as a web designer. And, uh, and then they helped me purchase my, my band. Mm -hmm. So you did a little bit more training then um, 
but most of it sounds like it was kind of self-training after, after your injury. Uh, that's, well, there was some, I mean, a lot of self-training, but I did do some certificate programs uh, mm -hmm. through an online course at the New School University for web design. And then uh, I hooked up with DVR, and after doing a few websites, decided I didn't like it, and uh, got into 3D game animation, and that led into working on video games, which is what I'm doing now. Now, Elaine, I'm going to go back to you because you've done quite a bit of additional schooling since um, that first foray to the, the vocational program or the tech program that you went to. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about kind of your school trajectory. Well, well first half of my career, I was a secretary and um, actually worked at a university. And then um, I won the Miss Wheelchair America pageant and they, I won a full-ride scholarship to get my bachelor's degree. It, it actually took me 17 years to get my associate's degree, and I hope no one can relate to that. <laughs> it's that one class at a time thing where, you know, you just, then you change your major, then your credits are old, and, and so I didn't get really serious about it until the end, and, and um, I was pregnant when I finished my associate's degree, finished my master's degree when my son was six. So, um, and worked, <laughs> you know, and it was, um, horrible math and test anxiety. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. I just never thought I could pass a math to get an associate's degree. Then Tacoma Community College offered a class called Managing Math Anxiety, and it changed my life. And I finished my master's degree with a 4.0 because of that. <laughs> Excellent. So you had some financial support for your college, um, but did you get any, like, did you go to disability services? Because I, and I'm just wondering if some of that has changed over time. I didn't. I won the full ride scholarship for my bachelor's degree, and I'm Alaska Native, and um, through my Alaska Native Corporation, I was able to get some scholarships, <laughs> but I did have to take out a student loan for my master's program. There's less funding available the higher up you go, right? right? So, um, yeah, so I did take a student loan out. That. For that, yeah, but I was able. My dad got us a little piece of stock when my brother and I were babies and <laughs> from mobile oil and paid off my student loan. So, thank you, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kurt, you know, the experience of kind of the schooling and, and that, what does disability services really provide for people um, who need extra assistance? Well, to start out with the funding, I think the Division of Oak Rehab is probably the, the, the prime factor now for providing a lot of funding for uh, young people to go to school and continue their educational process. And I have known DVR to actually cover all the way up through a master's degree. Okay. Um, but again, you, you need to have a, a goal in mind. Uh, you need to demonstrate that you have the aptitude, interest, and motivation to achieve that through you know prior educational activity or testing or uh, something what we call situational assessment and then um, once you've identified that goal and they've looked and they've found there's a labor market uh, within the local area uh, they'll usually will support that so the funding is, is a big piece from the division of oak rehab but they're not going to pick a, a person up until they've uh, initiated a, uh, an application for a pell grant and a pell grant which is a, a federal uh, i don't know maybe to use the pell no, I didn't use the help. Yeah, it worked out. but it's it's available. So, uh, but DVR being a first dollar agency means that they are going to try to have everybody else pay for that before they come in to provide any kind of service. But then, uh, once the Pell Grant is used up, then the Division of Oak Rehab will come in. They'll they will fund uh, with purpose. They'll fund uh, the the school, the tuition. They'll fund the books. Uh, they will fund if you need assistive technology devices, a computer. Uh, software applications, uh, if you need a specific kind of clothing for a lab, that type of thing, they'll uh, fund all those kinds of things. So that's the funding piece and then from the accommodation standpoint from going into community colleges and that type of thing, uh, federal mandate is that all of our schools need to have a, a department within the educational facility where uh, somebody's going to oversee and assist students with any kind of disability a documented disability, I should say, uh, receive appropriate and reasonable accommodation within the classroom. And uh, you have to emphasize the student needs to bring that documentation in the beginning of the classroom so that they can then uh, apply, have the instructor or the uh, professor uh, knowledgeable about what their needs are going to be, whether they need extra time taking a test, 
whether they need a note taker or something like that, and they need to have that when the class starts rather than to come in midway through and just say, well, I need this and, and mm -hmm. provide documentation. So that's one of the things I appreciate about your department. You need to give us those kinds of documents with regard to what students uh, are going to need for uh, accommodation or reasonable accommodation in the educational mm -hmm. arena. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know somebody who they were able to even get their classes put closer together so that they didn't have exactly. to um, deal with kind of being so far apart in disability services. It's, it's amazing how many classes are actually on second floors without elevators and that type of thing anymore. And, uh, and yeah. the schools are kind of... Yeah, uh, did you have any kinds of accommodations like that, Elaine? Well, when I was a teacher, <laughs> I definitely did. Right. Because our elevator was always broken, and I insisted that my classes all be on the first floor. Right. Good for you. And um, but um, they were very accommodating to me. And, right. Uh, but I was lucky to be in some pretty accessible schools too. Right. So, uh, but yeah, I've I've been really lucky with with people um, you know, going out of their way to make sure that I was comfortable. A lot of times I'd have to turn a desk around, <laughs> the kind of desk where you actually sit, you right. know, and it's all one unit, so I would just have to turn the desk around so the desk was right in front of me, right. that kind of thing. Yeah, since you brought your own chair. Yes, exactly. You know, yeah. and I think some of this that's as more as important as anything is that from listening to you is that you were able to self-advocate. Right. And, and, it, and if you initiate and self-advocate, that's when you get things, things accomplished and done by going in and saying, I, this is what I need, this is my problem, this is how I can solve it, and this is what I expect you to do. And if I, you don't do that, then I'm going to just keep asking or I'm going to get some other systems to come yeah. back and, and can do that. You can't be embarrassed to ask no. for accommodations. Um, I had students that were embarrassed about telling about a, a learning disability. And, I'm like, come on, you got a teacher in a wheelchair here, you know, please don't be embarrassed, you know, to right. ask for accommodations. And, um, you know, you're just, you're helping yourself and you should never be embarrassed yeah. to ask for something like that. Absolutely. And I'm, I mean, that's very clear to me having gotten to talk to all of you that um, being able to advocate for yourself and make sure you get what, you know, what you need in order to be successful is definitely part of it. So I know, Chris, you were able to go back to your employer, um, but I know that you also did some training in that. So first of all, start by doing a little introduction of yourself, um, and then I would like you to talk a little bit about your kind of experience with retraining or getting new skills. Um, well, I was um, forever a contractor, cabinet maker, furniture maker, remodeled lots of kitchens and baths. And then I got hired um, by a local artist and, and worked for him and remodeled his studio and then sort of became manager of the studio. And, and that's where I got hurt was working in the scissor lift up in the ceiling doing a mock-up for a, an art project. And um, I fell off the scissor lift and, and ended up in the hospital on you know, C5. And, um, and he came in and, and just told me that you know, support me, that I'd have a job for life. And the chief financial officer was there, and her hair just fell out at that point. <laughs> but, um, he's uh, he's um, supported me and backed me. And I dabbled with a little AutoCAD at that time, and so I, I learned it as well as I could. And, and, you know, basically gained all the nuances in that, and um, and went into the design side of, of of at least the structural parts of the components of the the art, and um, and also the mock-up spaces. We we build the the space that the art's going to eventually hang in, so we can light it properly and show the client how it's going to look. Mm -hmm. So did you take any classes to do that, or was it all kind of self-taught along the way? Uh, pretty much basic common sense type stuff. Yeah. So. Well, maybe. For you, it was basic common sense. I don't know if everybody would say that. Yeah. So how different was it? Um, I mean, it, it sounds like it was still in your skill set, 
even though it wasn't exactly what you had been doing before, but it wasn't a completely different... No, it wasn't, idea. yeah, it was definitely along the same lines of uh -huh. what I was doing. And, then, and you know, I had to do a lot of design work in my building, you know, right. and structural and whatnot, so... Right, so it was more of just getting it onto the computer and mm -hmm. kind of bigger... Just hitting at that angle of it, yeah. so... And then I also, um, at, in the beginning of my accident, um, uh, I was working with somebody who, who um, I started a partnership with in another company. We started a company called Pinwheel, and we designed or built art for artists who couldn't build their own art type stuff. Uh -huh. So they would design it. it, and then you guys would so carry it out. We we'd actually design the components too, uh -huh. so they give a sketch what they want and make it happen. Uh, and then we make it happen. And so. did that company also start before or after your injury? It was after. After your injury. After, yeah. yeah. So is this, I mean, it sounds to me from what you had said, obviously you were an on-the-job injury. I'm assuming Labor and Industries was involved with your... Um, not with a lot of training or anything. Okay. Just uh, allowed me a pension. Right, so and helped with the initial costs mm -hmm. of your medical care and yes. and now pension, but um, you didn't get any assistance. Kurt, is that pretty um, common or uncommon? No, I'd say it's pretty uncommon actually that most people who have um, a labor and industry uh, injury, particularly if it's a spinal cord injury, uh, uh, labor and industry is going to, uh, it's pretty well put together by the Washington WAC about what requirements are going to need to be met, what kinds of uh, benefits are going to need to be given or provided, that type of thing. Um, so with spinal cord injury, uh, they're going to assign a vocational counselor. I'm talking now, Chris, rather than, and I'm surprised that they didn't have somebody come visit you about that. Uh, but that vocational counselor is going to come and uh, provide some insights with regard to uh, do you have the transferable skills or the ability to go back to your old job and if you can go back to your old job, um, what kind of accommodations do we need to have? Uh, so this vocational counselor is going to go through all those kinds of issues, look at the essential job functions, look at the physical capacities of the job, the physical requirements and then help the individual uh, either go back to their old job or move into another job that's more appropriate to their to their needs. So, uh, labor industry will provide. Uh, and again, I'm not a complete expert on labor industry uh, rules and, and regulations and laws, but uh, you, they're going to get about uh, two years of training. Uh, this is what they had the last time I looked. I mean, about two years of training and a, and a certain dollar amount of of how much they can spend for that kind of training. Um, the labor industries, is, uh, spinal cord injury doesn't uh, get the kind of pressure that a lot of other workers tend to get sometimes with regard to uh, going back to work again. So it, it's nice that an individual can take their time, uh, make good sound decisions about going back to work if that's their wish. Uh, you know, in my line of work, work doesn't have to be uh, always for profit. I think that work can uh, also be a non-paid activity. Uh, I think work is a productive activity that uh, we all tend to look at as uh, being therapeutic and, and giving us a purpose. And uh, so I think that uh, Labor Industries gives an individual an opportunity to come back at their own time, at their own speed, and, and make good sound decisions about what's available out there. So Chris, what was the time between your injury and actually going back into the workplace? Um, several months, basically. So uh, that's pretty short. Yeah, once I got out of rehab, was injury was in August, mid-August. I was done with rehab in December. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably was heading back to work around March or so. Mm -hmm. But then I, you know, I actually didn't get hired back until mid-summer. I did a three months of just showing up and getting, you know, involved kind of, in the project. It sounds like somewhat what Kurt was just saying, of mm -hmm. kind of getting started with being back in the, the routine of mm -hmm. showing up, 
kit, figuring yeah. out kind of how you were going to fit in with the group. Were those right. kind of things that were going on between the exactly. March and, and the summer? Exactly. Do you, did you think that time was helpful for you? Um, yeah. It, 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 well, it showed my employer of my commitment to getting into it and right. getting back to it. And um, also allowed me time to get a vehicle and, and things like that, which, oh, and I didn't really, I think they put my lift in my car and that was about it. I had to buy the car myself, mm -hmm. have the floor lower, lowered and all that. So. so you had to do a lot of that stuff yeah. yourself. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So, um, and then from the time that you were back to work and back on the payroll, um, did you go right into, what, how much are you working right now? I work um, about 25 hours a week. Five, has, so five has that hours been a pretty day. consistent since yeah. that time? What yeah. kind of accommodations did they have to make at the workplace to allow you to kind of come back in? Um, create an office on the on the ground floor, I'm near the fabrication area, mm -hmm. and um, which is what I like, you know, to stay with the pulse of the projects and um, and um, yeah, just laying out a desk that would work for me, and and I use a trackball and punch one key at a time, and mm -hmm. my keyboard, and have yeah. the phone next to me, and, and um, that's it. And it, the, the we've remodeled once and made it a little more comfortable and larger, easier for me to get in and out so that I can see people. So my back isn't to people, so I'm now turned around and facing, you know, people that go by or right. that come in the office. Right, so, so your have, back's not always to right. the door. Yeah. Right, which are, well, it's, that's, was the case in the very beginning. Yeah. But that, that you know, we resolved that quickly. Right. So they didn't have to, it sounds to me like they didn't have to make any major changes to this, to... Nothing major. They put in door openers for me mm -hmm. um, on several doors. I don't, I'm, I still don't have access to the whole facility. Yeah. Like I don't, there's no elevator. I can't go up to the upstairs, mm -hmm. which is unfortunately where a lot of meetings are and whatnot. But, but um, I have my little zone and, and my little niche there. So right. that seems to work out. Um, I don't feel really, I sort of feel a little bit pigeonholed in my job. There's not a lot of room for growth, I don't think, project management and whatnot, but, you know, I, some things you, uh, I, 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 I hate to say that I accept it, because I really don't, but that's just the situation. Where you are right now. Yeah. I was going to say, maybe some creative solutions might get you to... Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe can I say? Maybe. And your other business, you said you started another business. Yeah, um, and I did all the design work, AutoCAD work for that, and another partner who's really good at his fabrication skills and whatnot. And but that our we were in a, a government um, facility um, in South Seattle, mm -hmm. which the building got condemned. <laughs> so we instead of getting another shop, we ended up putting our stuff, all our equipment in containers, because my partner decided that he wanted to move out of state, and, mm -hmm. which still hasn't happened yet, but that's where our equipment remains. And right. So, so that's, that's sort of a, a ton right of hold right now. Yeah. So. so. Um, in terms of uh, kind of workplace stuff, it sounds like there's some things that are not so great, but that overall it sounds like you're kind of into the swing of things, yeah. a pretty regular routine. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty nifty job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to admit, um, I, I, I would hate to think of, you know, doing something other than what I'm doing. Right. So, so on it would on. be uh, everything else would be boring. Yeah. So, so not a bad situation. Not a bad really. situation, right. and I have great colleagues. Yeah. They're very, pretty incredible, yeah. and they travel all over the world and. I get to travel about once a year to a destination of my choosing, and uh, usually I stay within the continental U.S. But and someplace warm. Right. But you know that's that's my personal decision. preference. Yeah. Yeah. They don't require. Yeah. Well, you know, a trip to China or 
Indonesia might be a little bit harsh, right. a little bit long. Mm -hmm. I don't. I like direct flights, and, <laughs> and uh, the shorter the better. Right. Uh, so personal preference. Yeah, that's a personal preference. So Eric, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. What is your job at this point? Uh, I'm a uh, interface designer at a video game studio called Hairbrain Schemes. And um, I make interfaces. Can you tell me what an interface is? Is that something oh. that the gaming? Yeah, it's uh, basically when you look at an application on your phone or a piece of software on the computer, it's a lot of the buttons and menus and little fiddly bits on there. So there's information architecture that goes into how they're organized or graphic design and, and the layout or presentation of them. So it kind of draws from a few different skill sets, I guess. Yeah. So how long have you been with this company? Five days. Five days. Excellent. Yeah. So when we talked a little, mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, you were trying to do some contract stuff. So this has moved. Is this the same place you were doing contract stuff for? No. Um, actually, I was with the company about a year ago for two and a half years, and then that shut down, or mostly shut down. They had about 90 plus percent layoffs. And uh, so I started a contract shortly after that with another company. And that lasted about 10 months, I guess. And then they sort of ran out of funding, so my contract expired there. And about a month later, I guess, I'm with a new company. And it's just a month-long contract, at which point I have another month-long contract with another company and some people I know. So a lot of it has been networking and that type of thing has really helped. So when you, you mentioned that when you first um, were getting back into work, that you were not working for a year or two, is that right? Um, was it a couple I, of years before you were really back into the workforce? It was quite a few years, I think about eight years actually, before I really had a full-time job at an office. Right. Before that it was you know school and uh, self-employment, working from home. Right. So did you take advantage of any benefits? Yeah, um, DSHS and SSI, I think, or one of the two. It's been a little while, but I did have assistance. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide was the right time to move off of having some of those services? Because those benefits do give you some help to pay for caregivers and medical right. care and things like that. So what was it that kind of helped you to make that transition off of that? Um, well, I think I had developed my skills enough at a certain point where I was able to start shopping them around and I finally got some interest um, and just you know went for it. It was enough where I would be able to make enough to cover what I wasn't going to get from SSI because as soon as you start making money, that comes directly out of the money they give you. And so, which was about to the tune of $20,000, which covered my caregivers. Um, so I had to make more than that really too kind of make it worth it. Mm -hmm. So it took a little while to get there and drag my feet through various other interests and occupations and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was doing 3D uh, stuff at first and had a really hard time finding work there because there's just a glut of 3D artists in the game industry, which is one of the reasons why they don't get paid very well. And uh, so then I kind of got back into doing graphic design and then that kind of turned into uh, user interface design, which is basically graphic design for video games. So in all of this world that you work in, it seems like there's a lot of changes that happen. Companies come and go, and yeah. contracts come and go. Do you ever have worries about con you know, continuing employment or being able to kind of cover your caregiver costs? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, an issue. Um, it helps, um, you know, it helps to be uh, full-time somewhere because you can get benefits. Obviously, you have medical, and then once you've been laid off, you can get unemployment. Uh, I'm, I was on unemployment for about a month after my last contract um, from the full-time job I had a year before, but I uh, wasn't eligible for the contracting I had done after that. So, um, And a lot of the work 
in my industry, especially when you're starting out, is for contract employees. So you kind of get hosed. So are, at this point, with these contracts, are you still kind of looking for a full-time job then too, like the more permanent, less, not a contract job? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I would like. And yeah. I, would, I definitely want it to be a right fit as well with the uh, people in the place and the projects and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of factors really that go into it, but definitely looking for something stable. Yeah, absolutely. So Kurt, I think that's one of the things that um, I often hear people talk about when they think about work is when they are, you know, they have some benefits and they have some coverage and maybe you can talk a little bit about what typically is available for people soon after an injury. Um, how do you make the decision and how do you encourage people to make that decision about whether they're ready to make the leap to being able to pay for everything themselves versus not and are there other programs that exist? Yeah, there are and I, the, I want, I'd like to say one thing is it's, it's pretty obvious right that you, you're, you're pretty good self-advocate I mean you know your skill set you can market yourself you uh, get out and you can promote the specific kinds of skills you have and I think that's what it really takes is for an individual to, to know who we are what our interests are what our skills are and we may not have the physical capacities to do some kinds of jobs, but we still have the, this knowledge base that we, with some kind of accommodation or modification, we can do a, a tremendous amount of, of, of work that, that's still available in our labor market out there. Um, but back to your question, uh, Social Security disability is probably the primary uh, funding source for many, many people uh, following some kind of catastrophic injury, uh, unfortunately. Uh, SSDI uh, is, is available for people who, uh, well, actually not unfortunate, but it's going to have to wait five months before you can get paid uh, following injury, which is a real hardship for a lot of, of, of folks out there. But to qualify for Social Security Disability, you need to be uh, disabled from any job in our national economy for 12 months or more. So uh, if you can go back to your old job with any kind of modification and that job is available, uh, you're not going to get your Social Security. Uh, so for uh, a lot of folks who are the quadriplegic, uh, folks are, are probably going to get SSDI quicker than some of the paras out there because they find that the uh, paras are, are, can go back to work easier. I don't, I don't ask me why. There's no fairness in any of this out there. So. Uh, but SSDI, Social Security Disability, it comes based on your prior work history. An individual needs what they call 10 quarters of, uh, of employment, uh, making, uh, and I'm, I'm ballparking this because I don't remember the exact figure, but about $1,600 uh, per certain time period, and you need 10 of those quarters to qualify for that, ba beside the fact of being totally disabled from any job in the national economy. Now, that said, once you, you you've achieved, or once you've been approved for Social Security Disability, uh, then a wide variety of programs become available to you, for, particularly with return to work, if that's a goal that you, you might have is going back to work. So uh, they have just a standard return to work program where an individual can go to another uh, uh, state or federal agency such as Division of Volk Rehab, or they have another program which is called Ticket to Work, uh, which everybody kind of in, visions this ticket, this golden ticket coming in the mail there. And, and it's really just a, a letter uh, that Social Security sends out uh, indicating that uh, you, because you have SSDI, uh, you are eligible for uh, vocational services and that may be going back to school, that may be uh, having some kind of adaptive equipment uh, provided for you, those kind types of, of activities. And uh, they have uh, employment, uh, specialists in the community uh, with for Ticket to Work specifically that assist people. But probably the primary uh, agency that does the Ticket to Work comes right back to Division of Volk Rehab again because Division of Volk Rehab has the funds to actually uh, do the uh, pay for school, pay for tuition, pay for assistive technology. And that's, uh, I think, the, the biggest piece uh, is the assistive technology a lot of times that an individual needs to come back and uh, complete or go back to work for that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the last part of that question, because um, I gave you a lot, uh, <laughs> was, um, you know, how, how do you counsel people to make the decision or 
you know, how do they, how do you help people balance out the losing benefits versus, um, you know, kind of striking it out on your own? It's a huge factor for, for lots and lots of folks and deciding, you know, and, and the worry's been taken out. Of, everybody's always worried about if I go back to work, I'm going to lose my, my financial uh, safety net that, that I have coming in, and I'm going to use all my uh, medical benefits, which uh, people really don't care so much about the financial as they do the medical side of things mm -hmm. a lot of times. So, but they have now uh, set up uh, Social Security on these types of programs where you don't have to worry about that. They've they got great return to work programs where you can, you can actually collect both your Social Security disability income as well as your full paycheck for a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to continue to, if you're on Medicare, you're going to continue Medicare for uh, extended number of years, and I'm, I want to say nine years. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, after you're fully employed, um, so those are just some of the benefits that Social Security Disability can provide you. And mm -hmm. Social Security uh, will work with when you become eligible for uh, Workman's Comp. Uh, Workman's Comp says that well, now that you're here, we you have to apply for Social Security Disability. So, uh, and then what happens is the state workman's compensation program will pay half and Social Security will pay half. So you, can, you can't combine both of them. You, you need to each pay half to, to bring you back up to that level again mm -hmm. of funding. And then you have to find uh, your own vocational services, whether it's your labor industries or division of oak rehab or SSDI. Right. So always a balancing act. Always a balancing act and always a frustration. And again, like I said earlier, there's really no fairness in any of it a lot of times. It's just a matter of continuing to just keep your nose to the grindstone, keep uh, making those calls and, and the frustration. I, I, I can't imagine the frustration yeah. <laughs> that folks go through out there with, with dealing with some of these agencies that are out there because they're, you feel like they're there to shut you down more than they are to actually give you a, a hand just because right. you need a short-term hand. So Elaine, I know that in some similar ways that you've had kind of the same situation of not the contract exactly, but the grants, working on these grants that end and then you have to find another job afterwards. So you shared some news with me. Tell me about what your job is. I just had a new job yesterday. <laughs> so you guys get applause. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I applauded you. earlier. <laughs> It's, uh, I'm going to be a career counselor at um, Evergreen State College, so and it's a regular full-time job, so I'm very excited. Thank you. I've been doing grant-funded jobs for seven years and not knowing if I'm going to have a job year to year, sometimes quarter to quarter, so it's very exciting to, to know that. And um, I'm at my master's degree is in human resources, and this is exactly what I, what I like to do. And just to talk a little bit about social security disability, I had um, quite a few pressure sores um, on my feet and it's kind of been a chronic problem. I was on social security disability and went back, finished my associate bachelor master's degree while I was on it and worked part time, but I worked too many hours. I misunderstood. I thought it was um, net and not gross income and I thought I could deduct my medical supplies that I was paying for and I did have to pay back $16,000. So, yeah, and it was, I was overpaid for a year. So, um, and I, I do know people that have gone through that too and it can be, can be really frustrating because um, I don't have $16,000 to, you know, be able to just write a check, you know, and pay that back. So, um, it can be frustrating. And I think it's gotten better since then. So I know with Medicare, they would pay for four catheters a month I use four or five a day, and now they, they actually like 180, I think, a month now. I think enough people advocated for that to be changed, so uh, because they're very expensive to buy yourself, so um, it can be frustrating, and it is scary to sort of cut the cord and and um, there's a 70 percent unemployment rate for people with disabilities, and and I can understand that. Mm -hmm. It's a job to get ready for your job, you know to do your personal care and, and shower and, and I'm sorry I'm, up, I'm going off no, topic, please. but it's, it's a lot to get to work, you know, and then commuting and, and um, 
just the complications, you know, that can come with your disability. And um, so it, it's a lot, and I understand that. And it is hard to make that decision because your body can rebel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you made the decision, and you're now in the career you kind of wanted to be in. I am in the career I wanted to be. Um, yeah, I, um, I was a teacher. I actually um, worked in the Human Resources Office at Tacoma Community College and found out I, that wasn't really what I was wanting to be doing. Ran into some old teachers and ended up teaching career classes for six years and for the Work First program and loved teaching, but again, it was grant funded. Was unemployed for six months after the funding ended and then took the job here in Seattle at the Seattle Indian Health Board where I've been for the last 10 months. So commuting has not been fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's absolutely a huge thing. Actually, you brought up an interesting point. So from the time that you get up to the time you have to be at work, what's, right. your, what's your schedule like? I'm not a morning person at all. Never had been, neither is my son. So um, I try to do as much at night as possible, showering and, and as much personal care as I can. I set out my clothes, everything, jewelry, pin, put on my, yeah, I mean, I'm just, everything, everything. is set out. And I'm backpacks by the door, lunch is made. And, cause, and I'm not allowed to change my mind. You know, right. every, I wear that and you can't change you know, anything. And, and that kind of thing really helps me a lot because yeah. I'm a night person. So how so, long for all of that work that you do at night? Yeah, if I have to wash my hair in the morning, <laughs> which I do in the sink so I don't have to transfer, you know, I'm sorry, that's too much information, but it's a big deal to take a whole shower versus just washing my hair. Yeah. So it's probably about an hour, uh -huh. so yeah. but. Sometimes I oversleep and they get what they get, <laughs> which is a little frightening, I'm sure. So, but hey, I'm at work. I'm yeah, at work. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. That's so, great. yeah. And so, Eric, how about you? What's your what time do you need to be into the office, or mm. do you you are able to work some from home though too, right? Um, at the previous gig I was at, they um, they were a startup and they were working out of somebody's condo and it wasn't accessible, so I worked from home and. Um, it was difficult at first because I wasn't used to being on site and it was hard to regulate you know, what I was doing. All my distractions were right there. And so, um, but eventually it, um, I sort of got in the groove and it was fine. Um, but in terms of routine, yeah. I'm not much of a morning person either, but um, I, that's when I do my thing so I can try to have some amount of flexibility in social life in the evening. And um, I usually do, uh, shower and personal care every other day um, and that takes minimum of two hours um, sometimes up to three and on a short day which is every other day it's about an hour so it's kind of it's kind of weird you know I might get into work uh, at 8 30 on uh, one day and then be in 10 30 the next day and it's like they don't I don't know what I don't know what they're thinking. No one's really commented on it, but it's usually pretty casual at the places I've been in. The culture is that people kind of get in around whenever they get in and right. stay pretty so late. That it's worked out well for you to not have to have a very tight yeah for yeah, sure because you know uh, things get in the way and there's a lot of um, variables because there's so many things that we have to do in the morning to get ready that maybe other people don't have to deal with or just the fact that I rely on someone else to be there. Right. If they don't show up um, or something like that, then that can really throw a monkey wrench into the plans. Absolutely. And how much caregiving help do you have in a day, typically? Uh, morning and night, okay. getting in and out of bed, dressed, mm -hmm. All right. shower, your morning routine. bathroom, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So about two to five hours a day, I guess, depending on if it's been a long day or not. Yeah. How about you, Chris? What's your routine like in the morning, and how long does that take you? Um, usually, uh, the the caregiver turnover is at 7 a.m. I have a nurse that comes and helps me get the bathroom routine. Yeah. It's every day, and about two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I'm lucky I don't have to be at work till 11. 11 to 4, I have banker's hours. Excellent. So, um, and that's probably why I'm pigeonholed in my spot, because you know, the, the work day is longer than that. Yeah. And, um, but you know, that's, you, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, two hours basically to 
get up and I do a shower every day. Right. And, and so you actually have a couple hours then, it sounds like, if you're up around 7 getting I, things started, then you actually have a little time in the morning to... Yeah, to take care of your you know, life. all those things that you just yeah. tend to put off and whatnot. But, um, I bet you could still do that too. Yeah, yeah. And I probably could sneak another in, hour in at work, but right. it's it's comfortable right now. Right. You like your routine for the most part. Yeah. Even though it kind of has some limits, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. But it's been, it sounds like they're working with you with that. They're, yeah. They're comfortable with that schedule, Yeah, too. they are. Yeah, absolutely. So they know that I'll show up. Yeah. And how much caregiving do you have? Um, I had 22 hours a day. Now I have to, Elle and I demanded that I have 24, so. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Who are you to argue, yeah, right? Yeah, no. Um, so that works for me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Chris, so what kind of advice would you give to somebody who might be in a similar position as you were, who um, you know, is injured and is trying to figure out how to get back to work and may or may not have an option to go back to their prior employer? Mm. Well, I think um, you should just pursue your interests. I mean that's, and that's that's where you should start, and um, because that's where you're going to be the happiest in the end, and um, figure out some way to at least get your foot in the door. Um, like I, I would, well, when I got hurt, I like I said I was going back for three months to try and sort of shape my position back at the company. So what I was able to. To actually go in and, and do that, which was lucky, mm -hmm. very fortunate. But, right. But um, beyond that, um, you know, I, I would think that I would would have gone into some sort of design, anyways, mm -hmm. furniture or structure or whatever. Right. Maybe, and th I, I know that that was available if I needed it. Yeah. So. Um, I didn't. I I didn't have a lot of vocational. There was some OT um, during while I was in the hospital, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter, but that sort of dropped off. And and um, but then I was basically had an idea of what I wanted to do or what I could do mm -hmm. uh, to support the you know the company right. in some way. Right. So you were highly motivated to go back. You, mm -hmm. it was something you would love to do, um, and you had an employer that. So it was, was a nice combo to. of all three of those mm -hmm. that happened for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's been lots of layoffs, so you know I don't really feel absolutely secure. No, I don't no. think anybody probably does. No. Yeah. No, it, uh, you know, the, it goes up and down a lot. Right. So we tend to cater to the one percent, which helps. A lot, but um, even no, even still, right. you know the the corners are cut and yeah. and whatnot. Right. Not a lot of frivolous spending out there anymore. Yeah. Do you right. think about sometimes about what else you might do or what you might want to do in the future? Um, I don't know. I have lots of ideas, and you know, uh, just things that I'd like to uh, produce. You know, I have little devices, yeah. especially, you know, handicap devices that I come up with every once in a while. It's like, gosh, you know, I really should, you know, get this on paper and get this, you know, a patent done and right. start manufacturing something. And uh -huh. There's a couple of ideas. Right. But then, you know, I find that I spend, you know, the time at work and, and some time before and after doing work right. that by the time it comes to dealing with the things I have, you know, my ideas, I'm right. sort of tired of it, burned out, don't, right. don't want to do that anymore, yeah. give me a break. And, yeah. and, You're busy and that, working. Yeah, so too, yeah, too busy. And then when I'm at work, I, I don't take any breaks and, you know, from start to finish and go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of fries you yeah, at the end of the day. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet you're tired by the time you're mm -hmm. done for the day. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, Elaine, what kind of advice would you give somebody 
about returning to work or thinking about work after spinal cord injury? I think you had a really good point about you know finding something you really enjoy doing and have a passion for, absolutely. Because it's a lot of time that you spend you know, at work and getting ready for work and commuting to work and you have to really like what you do. And it's understandable that you have to have a job to pay the bills, but if it's something you really enjoy, it, sh it sure helps. Mm -hmm. And having you know, a place that you know, makes you feel valued and, and I absolutely agree with what you said that work is an important part of a uh, person's life. And it doesn't have to be paid work, you know, it can be volunteer work and be very rewarding and you can kind of get out of your own situation and, and see what other people are going through and, and feeling like you're a contributing member of a team and, and um, I, I've always worked um, for 30 years, you know, except for some health problems um, where I've taken time off but, or, or I've gone to school. And it's just, I guess, who I am. Mm -hmm. It's just um, really important to me because I'm a very social person, and and um, you know my friends work, and and um, but yeah, definitely find finding something you're passionate about, and not being afraid to ask for help. So and saying that you need something, you know, if you're going to school, if you're going, because I think there is a misnomer of that accommodations can be expensive, but it might be lowering the paper towels, you know, in the bathroom, mm -hmm. or, you know, something, um, a lower coat rack, you know, they did that for me, put in a special coat rack. Um, I have a reacher stick, you know, that I have in my office, something falls, because it always does, you know, <laughs> it falls, you know, under my desk, or, um, so it's really not a lot, you know, I, um, Automatic doors can be about five thousand dollars a door, so that's a lot, you know, to, to ask. Um, I've had places offer to do it for me, and some it's nonprofit, and it's just, you know, it's not possible. But I, I really think it's so worth, you know, just like you said, having a reason to get up every morning, having a goal, having, you know, um, the social interaction, and and. Um, I think it's really important because it's really easy to stay home all the time and be depressed <laughs> and feel like you're the worst person, you know, off, you know, in, in the world that no one has bigger, we can, everyone can do that. Right. And so um, getting out and working has been really fulfilling for me. And I've tried to do, I tried a non-traditional job for a person with a disability. I worked retail at Toys R Us. I was the they did the baby and gift registry just because I, I love retail and I always wanted to know if I could do it from a wheelchair and so I did that for a year and um, I'm so glad I tried and I had other people come in in wheelchairs saying oh I never thought about retail you know thank you you know and and um, so people would come in the store like do I help you or do you help me they weren't <laughs> quite sure what to do and um, so I think it was a really good learning experience and um, I really had fun with it. I was a personal shopper. If you love to shop, that's like a dream job. Yeah. And um, so um, trying new things like that, right. that seem like, oh, you know, could I do that? I don't know. It, and I went in, they had a group interview, and the, the supervisor, you know, he said, do you think you can do it? I said, I don't know, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. and it was great. It was when I was in college, and it was a very low stress job. and. And uh, it was really fun for a year. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, it's very clear that you um, have, uh, going from somebody who didn't think they could do college to graduating <laughs> with your master's and having tried all these things, that that yeah. certainly um, was, you know, that's a, a big plus, I would guess, from Kurt's perspective as well. Like, you'd probably be the easiest person to help with uh, <laughs> return to work because you'll do most of it anyway. <laughs> well, thank you. Eric, how about you? What's, what advice would you give to somebody well, uh, you know, I totally agree with what these guys said. I mean, that's yeah. it's definitely my, been my experience too. Uh, having a job and it's a very sort of normalizing experience uh, in some ways, and that you know you've got to commute and you've got to uh, you know try to show up on time and forget you know remember to bring your lunch and all these sort of normal problems that everybody has and. Um, while that's all a pain in the ass, it feels kind of good to have normal problems, you know, when you're stuck at home feeling sorry for yourself and, uh, you know, it's easy to kind of hide and, but when you're 
forced into these situations where you have to perform or um, you know it, uh, it helps you grow as a person and uh, my advice would be to um, get out there as soon as you can and, and do it as soon as you can I, mean, I waited for a while and I feel like I missed out on some some opportunities that might have been out there and uh, I'm glad that I'm out there now it's never too late I guess it's, I think both of those are good yeah. like it's never too late and it's never too early, probably. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to take that first step and sometimes even every other one after it. But uh, I feel like once you, uh, once you start working out those muscles, you know, you, uh, it becomes apparent that it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like some confidence and either mm -hmm. maintaining confidence, building confidence, or kind of you know pushing yourself uh, mm -hmm. is a big part of that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I think coworkers don't really know what to do, you know, too. Mm -hmm. and, and do I help you? Do I ask? Do I do? And so it's it's an educational process. Yeah, I would imagine. It around. sounds like you had that too, Chris, of just telling people how to have things work out for you in your workplace mm -hmm. too. And Eric, do you find that as well as you go to new places of figuring out what people need to know um, to kind of be helpful to mm. you? Yeah. Heat your lunch up or, you know. Yeah, I mean, you have to kind of details. be outgoing and not too afraid. What was that? Yeah, be yeah. comfortable. Just have it be normal. Mm -hmm. So helping them to figure out how to just be normal. Service dog has really helped, I think. Yes. Icebreaker? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Kurt, how about how about you? Do you have any um, final words or advice? Well, I do. I think it, it, you know it, this going back to work following catastrophic injury is a, is a double-edged sword. I think um, I, I always encourage people to try to find your joy, but be prepared to uh, find your worst frustrations as well, because your dreams can uh, be knocked down over and over again. And, and I, I thought it was interesting what you said, Eric, about getting back into it as quickly as possible. And I think that there's another side to that, too, where I, I, I encourage people to, to really think about, um, you know, looking at avocational kinds of interests and, and looking about your community and your local labor markets and things like that and thinking about uh, finding some kind of volunteer opportunities, some avocational interest in, the, in your area of interest and, and kind of self-evaluating uh, am I ready to go back to work right now and looking at, you know, what we talked about getting up in the morning. All, I mean, I, the general public has no clue what, it, uh, what it's like to, uh, for folks to get up and get to work and prepare themselves to go to work in the morning. Um, so through volunteer, volunteer kinds of activities, uh, lots of times folks can get actual uh, job responsibilities that they never would get any other time. And, and through those job responsibilities, I think we self-evaluate, we show other people what we can do, what we can't do, we network, and we do all kinds of activities like that. And I think as much as anything, we really show if we're going to, uh, you know, request services or benefits from some program, you know, what we can do because we can get those letters of uh, recommendations written and that type of thing. But the other thing I, I think that people need to be able to do, like we've been talking all night, and that's self-advocating, being able to really describe who we are, articulate our specific kinds of skills that we have, and being able to talk about, yeah, I know I've got all kinds of barriers, physical kinds of obstacles uh, to do, but you know, uh, this is how I can get around that. I'm going to do a little bit different than everybody else, and I may take a little bit longer, but by God, it's going to be a better job than somebody else may have done. And uh, I'm going to stick around longer. You give me a break, I'm going to give you a break. And I think if you can find somebody, a confidant, like a, a I call it a job coach or a vocational counselor or somebody that you can really talk to about these kinds of activities, um, you know, and, and just because, it, like in Volk Rehab, a lot of people, or DVR people, say, oh, I don't like my DVR counselor. They just say no about this, and they say no about that. But I think that it's really important that you say, well, you know, I don't like this counselor, and I want a different counselor, and, and have the confidence to say, you know, I'm sorry, but I, you and I just <laughs> were going in different directions. And I, I think that, uh, and as a professional, I've had plenty of people say, you know, <laughs> What you think I should do and what I think I should do are two different things, and I would like to talk to somebody else. And I, and I, I understand that, 
And I think that most uh, professionals, uh, as a counselor or as a, as a professional, do understand that, you know, we can't meet everybody's needs and, and go forward. But so have the confidence to say, you know, you and I are going to go in different directions here and okay. do something else. So, so that, and I, and I think I, I talk to folks about, um, you know, what, was, what brought you joy? I mean, what, what were you really, really proud of in your life? What did you really work very, very hard to achieve? And wow, it, it came to fruition for you. And how can we use those kinds of uh, situations now to look at our labor markets and that kind of thing? So, Any questions from the audience? I realize we're um, getting close on time. Um, any questions that anybody has? So the question was, I'm going to repeat for the... Um, is, is there, was there somebody you had to actually convince that it was okay to go back to work or who didn't necessarily really believe, whether it was in the medical field or family or friend or, how about, start with you, Eric. Um, I, I don't know that anyone really came out and doubted my ability to do that, be it employers that I was interviewing with or family or friends. I, you know, it seemed like everybody wanted me to succeed. At least that was my impression. Okay. Um, I would say that I was probably my biggest doubter, so I had to convince myself that okay. I could do it, and it took a while. Yeah. How about you, Elaine? I think it was my parents, because I was 17 when I was injured, and they were protective of me, and, and I don't know, something lit underneath me, though, and I became really independent and had my first mortgage when I was 21, <laughs> so, and so I did. I just, it was really important for me to be independent. And they honestly thought that I would sit at home the rest of my life in a sweatsuit and they would take care of me. You know, they did. That's, that's what they plan, planned on. My, my parents, you know, are, my dad's in his 80s now and that was just the generation that they would take care of me and, you know, this is, this is how it's going to be. And, and, um, and you showed them. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Kurt, so is there common mistakes that you see people make? Well, I, I think the biggest mistake, the, the common mistake is that uh, people that are trying to find a job forget that it's a job trying to find a job. And, and, they, and they don't uh, focus on the fact that I need to set out goals for myself every single day, that I need to really uh, work towards these specific activities and know that, you know, if I don't do this, it's not going to get done. I mean, you know, I don't care what agency you're working with, that they've got 10,000 files they're working with here and 1,500 clients that they're working with here, and I'm, for all practical purposes, a number. And, and I, I, I'm the one that makes a difference here, and I need to uh, lay my plan out. I need to know that I need to get this documentation, this paperwork filled out, because it's not going to get done otherwise. And you still have to prove you're the most qualified. Absolutely. It doesn't matter yeah. if you're in a wheelchair. You have to absolutely. Um, and I think that if somebody doesn't, when you go to all that work to get something done, if somebody doesn't reply or respond the way you want it to, that it's, it's up to the individual to say, keep, the squeaky wheel gets the oil and you, and you keep working at that and have a, you know, you don't have to be obnoxious about it, but I do think that you just lay your case out every single time in a very objective way and uh, move forward like that. But again, I mean, you, finding a job is a job. You, know, you just have to focus like that. So the question was kind of how do you work to keep your job in terms of any kind of health issues or the days the caregivers may not kind of fall, come through and how do you manage like vacation and sick leave and do you use it all, do you save it? Do you overwork? Do you work more hours? How do you handle it? Who wants to start? Sure, I'll go. Um, well, uh, I try not to squander them, especially up front, um, because, you know, like I had said before, caregivers might not show up. There's a lot of variables. Things can happen, and uh, you want to have those days so they don't cut into your um, your pay. Or, and you don't want to also develop a uh, reputation as somebody that, is never at work or is, you know, chronically has problems. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, you're there to fulfill a need for the employer. And, um, you know, we're at a bit of a disadvantage maybe because of our situation, so. How about you, Elaine? Um, well, I have a secondary um, situation where I'm diabetic, uh, type 2 diabetic. 
which has just been within the last five years. And so <clears throat> I was in a bit of denial at the beginning. And so I realized how important it is, you know, to eat well and to get enough sleep. You know, I have to go to bed at 9.30 and it's, it's really sad. <laughs> My son had to wake me up for New Year's. It was, yeah, but it's, um, you really have to take care of yourself. And I have to say, eat your lunch, go to the bathroom and take care of yourself and rest on the weekends. And I have to have one day out of my chair and that's usually Sunday. And I just am out of my chair for that day. My son has to understand that. Um, I just have to um, have a rest day to take care of myself. I have gone to four days a week so I can have a day to do doctor appointments when I had my last bout with pressure sores. And, um, and it was just a day to take, it was quite a bit of a pay cut, but my boss was very understanding. This is probably too much information, but I have a whole change of clothes at work because I'm quite a ways from home. And, you know, God forbid, you know, you have a bladder problem or, you know, something. And, you know, you have to be prepared like that. Otherwise, I'd have to go all the way home, you know, for something like that. And, um, you know, and really be honest, you know, with your boss, you know, I don't usually tell people that I'm diabetic. You know, I talk about, you know, being in a wheelchair, you know, first, and then tell, yeah, then hire me, you know, right. and then I'll tell you about being diabetic. And um, so, but I think that's anyone is taking care of yourself and, and um, getting my flu shot and, and um, trying to stay away from sick people and, you know, just all the things, you know, the self-care stuff, get massages and, you know, because I get neck and shoulder pain from being on the computer, which I'm sure you can, you can both relate with, you know, and so that's hard. It's hard on your body yeah. to work. And so taking care of it so you don't get carpal tunnel and, you know, just, um, yeah, it's, um, but my vacation days, I tried to save them up. So around Christmas time, so I had 10 days off, you know, in a row where I was going to already have days off. So I just took two more off and then had 10, day, 10 days off in a row. And um, so if you can bank them up like that a little bit, right. that you really does help. get a real break yeah. sometimes. But I take a mental health day every once in a while too and just sleep. Right. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. How about you, Chris? Um, I can work from home if I need to. And I do if, you know, if the situation calls for it. Calls for it. Um, I, I use up all my vacation time every year. Uh, sometimes I bank sick time. Mm -hmm. um, other times I can't because of, you know, uh, uh, something that comes up, whatnot. Um, went through training with him for two weeks this year, so that took a big chunk of my free time. But they're pretty flexible mm -hmm. um, as long as I, and I do work, you know, I work from home and don't, you know, a lot of times I work late at night and and don't even charge. I, I work on a, a wage, uh -huh. so um, sometimes I don't, you know, account for that in the bookkeeping. But right. just as long as the projects get done, right. So, so your ways of kind of balancing mm -hmm. all of that out. Yeah. Well, we are actually out of time, um, so I want to wrap up. But I really want to thank you guys very much, and if you'll join me in a round of applause. Thank you all very much. This is fantastic.